It is much more difficult in theory than actually to say the last goodbye to one's friends and loved ones and to all the familiar things of this life. I'm going to take a long, deep, and endless sleep. This is not a punishment, but a privilege to which I have looked forward for long years. I have loved my work. I have loved people and my play. But always I have been uplifted by the thought that what I have done well will live long and justify my life. That what I have done ill or never finished can now be handed on to others for endless days to be finished while I rest. And that peace will be my applause. One thing alone I charge you, live and believe in life. Always human beings will live and progress to greater, broader, and fuller life. The only possible death is to lose belief in this truth, simply because this greater end comes slowly, just because time is long. Goodbye. Welcome, thank you for joining us. And we do have, thank you first of all to all of you here in the in-person audience. Um, we also have people joining us online, so this is a hybrid program. So thank you to all of you either here in person, online, or who will watch the video later. Thank you again for your interest in this event. And now let's please welcome Christian Walks from the Museum of African American History. And thank you again for joining us. Christian. Good evening, everyone. Greetings. Uh, on behalf of the Museum of African American History, it is my honor to introduce our featured author, Chad L. Williams. Professor Williams is the Samuel J. and Augusta Spector uh, Professor of History and African American Studies at Brandeis University. He is the author of the award-winning book, Torchbearers of Democracy, African American Soldiers in the World War I Era, and the co-editor of Charleston Syllabus, readings on race, racism, and racial violence. His writings and op-eds have appeared in The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Time, and The Conversation. So it is my honor to welcome you this evening. And at this point, I will turn it over to our partner, Margaret Talgat at American Ancestors, NEHGS, who will introduce our moderator, Kendra Fields. Thank you, Christian. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce, um, as Christian said, tonight's moderator. Kendra Field is Associate Professor of History at Tufts University uh, and Director of its Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. She is the author of Growing Up with the Country, Family, Race, and Nation After the Civil War, um, a truly remarkable work that documents her family's migratory patterns after the Civil War. Um, and Professor Field is currently finishing up a new book, The Stories We Tell, A History of African American Genealogy from the Middle Passage to the Present. And lucky for me and for my colleagues, she's working closely with American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society on an exciting project that you're going to hear more about um, in, later on in the year. And we're really thrilled to be getting to know Professor Field and her work. It has really been a great honor for all of us um, at American Ancestors NEHGS. Um, but anyway, we welcome you and we really look forward to hearing more about this book. So over to you. Come on up. All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right, thank you, uh, Margaret, for those very kind words. Thank you, Christian, for your introduction. Uh, I want to thank the Boston Public Library for hosting us uh, this evening, uh, the GBH Forum Network, uh, the Museum of African American History, the New England Historic Genealogical Society, a uh, wonderful constellation uh, of partners making this event happen. Uh, welcome everyone who is watching online and for all of you in attendance this evening. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my book. Uh, then Professor Field and I are going to talk, 
and then we'll all talk, hopefully. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the conversation and uh, getting your thoughts um, on the book, if you've had a chance uh, to read it, uh, but to also ask uh, Kendra uh, and I any questions that you, you may have. But first, let me start in October of 2000. I had just started research for my dissertation on African-American soldiers in the World War I era, which would become my first book, Torchbearers of Democracy. And I was visiting the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where the papers of W.E.B. Du Bois are housed. Now, I had very responsibly, in advance, gone through the finding aid, and I saw a reference to Du Bois' World War I materials. So I was immediately intrigued. I go to the library special collections desk. I ask the archivist to see this uh, curiously titled Du Bois World War I collection. I'm expecting maybe a few folders, maybe a whole box of materials if I'm lucky. Instead, the archivist returns with six microfilm reels. So at this point, I'm really intrigued, all right? What could this possibly be? So I load the first reel, turn on the machine, slowly forward the film to the first frame, and this is what I saw. What I was looking at was the table of contents of an 800-page unfinished and unpublished manuscript by the great W.E.B. Du Bois on the black experience in World War I with the evocative title, The Black Man and the Wounded World. Now this was followed by the actual manuscript itself, along with all of Du Bois's research materials and his correspondence related to this project. Needless to say, I was shocked, thrilled, overwhelmed, probably a whole host of other adjectives, but in all honesty, I was confused. I had so many questions. What did I just stumble upon? What was this book? Why did Du Bois write it? What was this book about? How long did he work on it? Why did it remain incomplete, unpublished, and for the most part, completely unknown? Why is it even important? The story surrounding this forgotten book is truly remarkable. It's a story about the challenges of being African American. It's a story about race and democracy, about history and memory. It's a story about hope and disillusionment, faith and tragedy, determination and failure. It's a story of Du Bois in all of his brilliance and all of his flaws, wrestling with the catastrophe of war, its legacies, and the resulting historical and personal wounds. This is the story I tell in my book, The Wounded World, W.E.B. Du Bois and the First World War. Now, there's obviously a lot to say about Du Bois and his background. Uh, I'm sure some of this will come up in uh, the conversation uh, with Kendra and I. Uh, maybe we'll flesh out some of those uh, aspects of his life. Also, more than happy to answer any specific questions uh, anyone may have. But my story begins in 1914 at the start of the war. Du Bois considered himself a pacifist. He pinpointed the origins of the war in the competition amongst the European belligerents for imperial control of Africa and its people. However, he ultimately believed that the best hopes for democracy hinged on victory by the Allies over Germany. So when Woodrow Wilson addressed Congress on April the 2nd, 1917, and declared war on Germany, Du Bois, setting aside his pacifist principles, was not opposed to the United States entering the conflict. He argued that it presented an opportunity for African Americans to state claim to their citizenship and bring meaning, get down a second, to Wilson's claim that the world must be made safe for democracy. Black people had fought in the past, and now they would do so again, with hopes that the two warring ideals of being black and being American, that Du Bois so famously articulated in his classic 1903 book, The Souls of Black Folk, would at last 
be reconciled. So Du Bois threw himself into the war effort, encouraging African Americans as soldiers and as civilians to demonstrate their loyalty on the battlefield. But white supremacy tested his patriotism. Along with other African Americans, he had to reckon with moments like the horrific East St. Louis pogrom of July 1917, which left hundreds of black people dead. Du Bois' biggest test, however, came with the publication of Closed Ranks in the July 1918 issue of the Crisis magazine. The Great War represented the crisis of the world, Du Bois began. He argued that however distant the war seemed, black people had no ordinary interest in the outcome. For this reason, African Americans had to make their allegiances clear. Let us, while this war lasts, forget our special grievances and close our ranks with our own white fellow citizens and the allied nations that are fighting for democracy. We make no ordinary sacrifice, but we make it gladly and willingly with our eyes lifted to the hills. Closed ranks unleashed a firestorm of criticism. The Boston civil rights activist and one-time ally, William Monroe Trotter, labored Du Bois, among many other insults, a rank quitter of the fight for rights. A rank quitter of the fight for rights. From coast to coast, many African Americans branded Du Bois as self-serving at best and at worst, a traitor to the race. For a man who had committed his life to the cause of freedom and justice for black people, no charge could be more hurtful. The uproar and damage to his radical credentials left Du Bois deeply wounded. As the end of the war neared, Du Bois, his credibility tattered, his leadership in question sat in arguably the most precarious position of his otherwise illustrious career. Then, quite unexpectedly, an opportunity presented itself. At the October 1918 Board of Directors meeting, the NAACP proposed that Du Bois spearhead production of a book on the history of the black experience in the war. He leapt at the opportunity. The scholar in Du Bois was intrigued, but more importantly, here was a chance for redemption. He began work on the book and set his sights on France, where, as he would later write, the destinies of mankind center. On December the 1st, 1918, he departed from Hoboken, New Jersey, as part of the official press delegation accompanying President Woodrow Wilson to the peace conference at Versailles. Du Bois spent three months in France. He organized a landmark Pan-African Congress in February 1919. His principal mission, as he described it, however, was to conduct research for the NAACP war history. He toured the battlefields, seeing with his own eyes the incomprehensible devastation of the war. He stood in the trenches. Most importantly, he talked with black soldiers and officers. With military intelligence following his every move, Du Bois absorbed tale after tale, discrimination, slander, and abuse inflicted upon black servicemen at the hands of the American army. Never in my life have I heard such an astounding series of stories, Du Bois wrote from France in a January 1919 letter to his NAACP colleagues. He knew what needed to be done. I can say solemnly and without hesitation, he wrote, the greatest and most pressing and most important work for the NAACP is the collection, writing, and publication of the history of the Negro troops in France. Du Bois returned to the United States enraged, embarrassed, and determined. He channeled his frustrations along with the anguish of the African American servicemen he encountered in France into the crisis, and especially the May 1919 issue, where in the editorial returning soldiers, he declared, we return, we return from fighting, we return fighting. 
history would be Du Bois' central battlefront in the struggle over the meaning of the war. He encouraged readers of the crisis and black soldiers in particular to, in his words, help in the compilation of his book. Letters, diaries, photographs, official military documents, and personal memoirs quickly flooded Du Bois' office. Du Bois promised that the Negro in the Revolution of the 20th century, the initial tentative title of his book, would appear by the fall of 1919. Du Bois's faith in the revolutionary potential of the war would be severely tested throughout the summer of 1919. From Washington, D.C. to Chicago to Phillips County, Arkansas, race riots and full-scale massacres exploded throughout the country. The number of lynchings skyrocketed, which included many black veterans, some still in their uniforms. James Weldon Johnson, Du Bois' colleague in the NAACP, labeled these bloody months the Red Summer. The horror of the summer stunned Du Bois. As he wrote in his book, Dark Water, which he completed amidst the tumult and disillusionment of 1919, how great a failure and a failure in what does the World War betoken? Du Bois set out to answer this question. He committed himself to writing. He devoted significant time throughout much of 1920 and into 1922, often staying up late into the night, past his usual bedtime of 10 p.m., to drafting several potential chapters for what he confidently believed would be the definitive history of the black experience in the war. Du Bois's early chapter drafts reflected an attempt to try and find redemptive value in the global catastrophe and his own place in it. But his disillusionment with the war continued to deepen. The worsening conditions facing African Americans and peoples of African descent throughout the diaspora caused him to further struggle with the war's individual and collective meaning. There was also personal tragedy. In January of 1922, Du Bois lost his closest black friend and the man who best embodied the quest to reconcile race and country, Colonel Charles Young. Young was the highest ranking black officer in the army and black America's military hero. Think about Colin Powell before there was Colin Powell. It was Charles Young. He had been unjustly retired from active service during the war for dubious health reasons to prevent him from becoming a general. It broke his heart. The army reinstated him after the armistice and conveniently assigned him to Liberia. He would die in a Nigerian hospital. Over a year after his death, Young's body was finally returned to the United States and buried with full honors in Arlington National Cemetery. But Du Bois cannot forgive the government for the, in his words, inexcusable crime of denying Charles Young the opportunity to serve in France and yet sending him to Africa where he would die. Such ugly reminders of the war's legacy further validated Du Bois' title for his book, the new title for his book, The Black Man and the Wounded World. As the title reflected, Du Bois' initial hopes of the war as a potentially revolutionary moment in the reconstruction of global race relations had evolved to an interpretation of the conflict as one of the darkest moments in modern world history. The war was a global tragedy that, along with laying the seeds for future war, strengthened white supremacy and furthered the economic exploitation of peoples of African descent. No surprise, then, that he described the war in the opening chapter of his book manuscript as a scourge, an evil, a retrogression to barbarism, a waste, a wholesale murder. Du Bois's public announcement in 1924 of The Black Man and the Wounded World sparked renewed public interest in his book. Encouraged, he began to write again. By 1926, he had drafted the bulk of his envisioned chapters. The book, finally, seemed on the verge of completion. But Du Bois' guilt about his decision to support the war continued to gnaw at him. 
In a 1930 letter, letter to a magazine editor, he admitted that he was, in Du Bois's words, ashamed of my own lack of foresight. And that, quote, instead of a war to end war or a war to save democracy, we found ourselves during and after the war descending to the meanest and most sordid of selfish actions. And we find ourselves today nearer moral bankruptcy than we were in 1914. By the mid-1930s, Du Bois' politics moved further to the left, and he envisioned the black man and the wounded world as an explicit lesson in the horrors of modern warfare. A trip around the world in 1936 brought even greater clarity to the book's new significance. Du Bois spent seven months abroad, first visiting Hitler's Germany during the 1936 Summer Olympics of all times. Then he went to China, and finally visited Imperial Japan. He returned to the United States in December of 1936, having seen firsthand the seeds of the next world war. The need for his book could not have been more urgent. He wanted people to see that the still open wounds from the last war promised an even greater disaster in the near future. With a sense of desperation, he applied for funding support but was rejected at every turn. By 1940, just as Hitler prepared for the German army to invade France, Du Bois, disillusioned, disheartened, with a Second World War, a tragic reality, abandoned hope that he would finish and publish his book. Despite an investment of more than 20 years, despite a manuscript over 800 pages in length, the Black Man and the Wounded World, Du Bois' epic history of the black experience in the First World War would never see the light of day. So, why didn't Du Bois finish his book? I know some of you are asking that question. Right? As I make clear in my book, Du Bois suffered from what we might characterize as intellectual shell shock when it came to writing about and rationalizing a war defined by its irrationality. In his semi-autobiographical book, Dusk of Dawn, published in 1940, he wrote, in my effort to reconstruct in memory my thought in the fight of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People during the World War, I have difficulty in thinking clearly. In his semi-autobiographical, oh, excuse me, uh, he goes on uh, to write in his autobiography, which was supposed to be published in 1968. I'm not sure that I was right in his decision to support the war. But certainly my intentions were. I did not believe in war, but I thought that in a fight with America against militarism and for democracy, we would be fighting for the emancipation of the Negro race. With the armistice came disillusion. That disillusion stayed with Du Bois until his death on August 27, 1963, in Accra, Ghana. The war consumed Du Bois. It genuinely confounded him. He could not make sense of it as both a personal and historical moment. He was unable to muster the intellectual fortitude and, dare I say, the moral strength necessary to complete his book. His failure embodied the tragedy and failure of the war he struggled to write about. In this sense, the black man in the wounded world was Du Bois himself. So why does this story matter? And why does it matter today? Well, quite frankly, it matters because Du Bois matters. He remains arguably the greatest black intellectual this country has ever produced. And as I illustrate in my book, we're, allowed, we're able to understand him anew by acknowledging the importance of World War I in his life and work. Moreover, just as we rightly celebrate his genius, we must also understand his humanity, someone who hoped and dreamed, someone capable of making the wrong decision, someone capable of failure but also someone who changed. The failure of World War I and ultimately the failure to complete the black man and the wounded world were essential to his political evolution and his radicalism. 
By the late 1940s, he became a staunch peace activist and in the eyes of the federal government, in the midst of the Cold War Red Scare, a distinct threat. In 1951, he was indicted and tried on charges of being an agent of a foreign principal. He won an acquittal, but the ordeal and subsequent seizure of his passport by the government were a painful reminder that for a black person criticizing America and fighting for peace came with tremendous risk and cost. In his book, In Battle for Peace, published in 1952, Du Bois wrote, as then a citizen of the world, as well as a citizen of the United States of America, I claim the right to know and think and tell the truth as I see it. I believe in socialism as well as democracy, he wrote. Above all else, Du Bois added, I hate war. But the story I tell in my book also goes beyond Du Bois. It reveals to us the impact of World War I on African Americans, how it exposed the core tensions of African American identity, and how it shaped the history of racial struggle in the 20th century and up to the present. For Du Bois, the history of World War I was not simply an intellectual challenge. It was a profoundly personal, moral, ethical challenge as well. It still is. Du Bois understood that the history of the war was deeply bound with the political status of black people, the future of democracy, and the condition of the world we live in. It still is. More than a century after the First World War, many of the same struggles Du Bois confronted white supremacist violence, creeping fascism, wealth inequality, modern forms of voter disenfranchisement, right-wing assaults on the truth, exorbitant government spending on the military, preparation for endless war. All of these issues remain urgent matters today. Du Bois, through his life, his work, and his voice, has indeed tasked us with fighting for democracy and working with all of our strength to heal our still wounded world. Thank you. Um, it's a really a pleasure um, to be with all of you tonight, and um, and an honor to be um, to share this stage with my colleague and friend, Dr. Chad Williams, um, about this wonderful book. So um, I'm going to just uh, take a couple moments to ask a couple questions of my own, and then we have some advanced questions that came virtually. We have um, opportunity for those of you that are with us in person today to share your questions, and, um, and then those of you that are online with us to also um, chime in. So please start, if you haven't already, <laughs> um, generating those. Um, so I think the first question I wanted to ask um, is if you could share with us and with our audience um, um, a bit of you know, your own trajectory as a historian, what drew you to this subject in particular, um, the shift, your own journey from you know, into the black past from torchbearers through this book. You, you shared mm -hmm. a bit of it in terms of your archival discoveries, but, um, but what it meant for you to kind of um, launch into a book, you know, into a Du Bois book in this moment. <laughs> Yeah, um, launching into a Du Bois book, a, a daunting endeavor, as anyone who has ever <laughs> written a book on Du Bois will tell you. Um, I encountered Du Bois for the first time in college, reading The Souls of Black Folk. It was one of those texts that stays with you. Um, so I think Du Bois, his work uh, was foundational in shaping my identity uh, as a budding historian, thinking about my sense of vocation as a black historian, um, and ultimately what I wanted to do, uh, really fueling a passion for studying history, for, for reading and, and writing, um, for, for doing history, but also thinking about it in the context of the struggle for black freedom and, and equality uh, in this country and beyond. Um, as I said at the, the beginning of my uh, presentation, um, I encountered Du Bois's uh, World War I book while doing research for my doctoral uh, dissertation. I was immediately intrigued, fascinated, um, obsessed even. <laughs> Maybe that's uh, an inaccurate uh, description. <laughs> um, but I knew that I wanted to explore 
this really remarkable book that no other historian had, had talked about, um, at least in, in any great uh, detail. Uh, but it did take me some time to muster up the courage to write a book uh, about Du Bois because he is such a complex figure, um, so multi-layered. Um, and this was a book about a book he didn't finish. This was a book about Du Bois actually failing in, in many ways. Um, and approaching him in that way was um, certainly daunting, um, but uh, ultimately necessary uh, because I wanted to present a Du Bois that we hadn't seen before uh, to really demonstrate his full complexity, his full uh, humanity, and really think about the ways in which World War I was foundational to shaping his life, his intellectual work, and his political evolution. Yeah, um, and I guess as a, as a follow-up to that, you know, we, we have the privilege of, of sharing a, a mentor and a kind of a model in David Loving Lewis yeah. um, and his um, biography of Du Bois. Um, and I, I worked on um, editing that uh, volume over about 15 years ago now, and, and now I'm kind of um, re-entering, following your, <laughs> your footsteps a bit, um, the Du Bois world um, as he's a kind of main character, particularly his work as a genealogist and as mm -hmm. a family historian in the work I'm writing, uh, book I'm writing now. But it's kind of selfishly, I'd love to hear your reflections on um, you know, how you walk the line between not a biography, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet, I mean, how much of the backstory and, and how did you make those choices in the writing process um, yeah. of, of how to um, kind of thread that needle? Yeah, you know, I, I never thought that I was writing a biography uh, about Du Bois because David had already done that. Right? Um, what else you know, could I possibly say about Du Bois' you know, life in kind of traditional biographical form and structure? So I really wanted to think about how I can situate Du Bois kind of in the context and historical trajectory of World War I and its legacies using his unfinished book kind of as the, the narrative device, if you will, to, to tell this story. And in the process of doing that, I think I was able to talk about Du Bois and shed light on different aspects of his life that other historians hadn't fully uh, fleshed out. Um, so I guess you could say that I, I wrote a biography, <laughs> um, perhaps not intentionally, uh, but um, you know, I think there, there's so much still to, to learn uh, about uh, Du Bois. Um, and it was really exciting just to kind of scratch the surface in approaching him this way. Okay, I'm gonna ask uh, maybe one and a half more questions before I turn it over um, to our audience. Um, so, I mean, as you know well, and those of us who engage in African American history know well, one of the um, biggest challenges, the further we go back especially, is to access you know, what Elizabeth Alexander calls the black interior. Mm. Um, you referred to as you know, Du Bois' humanity. Mm -hmm. um, also can be especially daunting with kind of hero figures, as, as yeah. another of your mentors, Nell Penter, mm -hmm. Painter, early, said in the, as early as the 1970s. Yeah, right. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us how, uh, share a little bit about how you approached um, Du Bois, the private man, mm. um, Du Bois, the man, not the work, or the, um, uh, the banner, um, but his subjectivity, and in fact, his ego, as, as, as David Lewis said. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's certainly a lot about Du Bois' private life that I could have gone to, into, but decided not to. Um, you know, David does an amazing job of doing that in his biographies. But Du Bois' ego was certainly something that I had to wrestle with uh, because he was so deeply invested in this project, this history that he spent 20 years working on, writing, trying to get foundation support. Um, and you know, I had to, to really think about you know, what was Du Bois' uh, connection uh, to this, this project, and ultimately what did it say about his connection to the war uh, itself. And you know, in some ways, it really goes back to the, the souls of black folk, right? You know, where Du Bois is famously talking about double consciousness, the two-ness of, of African American identity, and how he viewed the First World War as an opportunity Right, as a moment to reconcile those two kind of warring ideals of being black and being American. And when that didn't materialize, 
when he supports this war, puts his credibility on the line, and his hopes don't materialize, you know, I think that deeply affected him, right? And I had to understand, okay, why? And how did that then um, manifest itself in terms of his attempts uh, to write what I'm convinced would have been one of his most significant works um, of history. Um, so, you know, that was, I, I guess, kind of a, a bit of psychoanalytic history I had to uh, engage in, psychoanalytic uh, analysis. Um, but again, I think it, it was necessary to really kind of peel back the layers um, of Du Bois uh, to understand why this incredible individual, right, this incredible intellectual who published 22 single authored books wasn't able to finish this one. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I was, I was struck by, um, I mean, it's, 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 it's just incredibly powerful to approach both the scholar and the subject, the scholar and the person living through history, mm -hmm. and, and was reminded of the fact that when, you know, the, the first book, arguably, that Du Bois started working on was actually Black Reconstruction I mean, in the 19, early 1900s, you know, and he's writing about a time period in which, um, which was ongoing at the time of his birth. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and what it means, you know, for me, who would be terrified to write a book about the 1970s or 60s. Right, right. Um, and, and then I was thinking about your um, work, um, one of your earlier works on um, uh, the Charleston syllabus, you know, and, yeah. and what it means to be a historian while also living through the times as they unfold. And I think yeah, yeah. Um, the book has so much to offer in, in that regard. Yeah. And I'm gonna tie it to my last question, which is, um, you know, you're also, um, you know, um, very proud to say an alumni of the Du Bois Forum that a few of us began um, with, with David, a retreat for writers, scholars, and artists of color and a collaboration um, between the African American Trail Project and the Du Bois Freedom Center, which will be the first um, museum in North America dedicated to Du Bois' life and work. Um, and I, um, this is, the latter is very much a public Du Bois project. So I mm -hmm. wonder, um, as my last question before we turn it over to the audience, if you could talk a bit about how you grappled with kind of the collective memory, the public memory of your two subjects, Du Bois and World War I, yeah. right? And, and they kind of intertwined those in, in, a, in a scholarly mm -hmm. work. Yeah, it's a, a great question. You know, I think that World War I still remains kind of the forgotten war in American public memory. Um, that's something that I wanted to address in my first book, Torchbearers of Democracy, to try and emphasize the significance of World War I, the World War I era more broadly uh, for uh, African Americans, particularly in kind of the long struggle for uh, citizenship and, and freedom and uh, democracy. Um, I think Du Bois understood that uh, as well. He understood that in the moment. He understood that throughout the 1920s and 30s, even up to the last days of his life. I'm convinced that he understood just what a significant moment uh, the First World War was um, in the broader history of, um, uh, of the world, of, of democracy uh, uh, itself. Um, I think that Du Bois remains such a pivotal figure in so many different ways. He's a touchstone for so many critical issues um, of our times. Um, I think the, the recognition, the public recognition that he is continuing to, to garner, um, you know, which has been a struggle, uh, as you know, um, is, is well deserved. Uh, but I also think we need to, as I write about in my book, understand Du Bois in his full uh, complexity, the full arc of his life, and his political um, evolution. And one of those aspects of his life, which I think we don't give enough attention to, is his anti-war beliefs, right? The fact by the 1950s, right, the federal government is ready to put 83-year-old Du Bois in jail, right, for advocating for peace, right? Understanding how Du Bois, who in 1918 is encouraging African Americans to close ranks and forget their special grievances, fight for your country, be loyal to your country first and foremost, right? How by the 1950s, he's ready to go to jail for his anti-war beliefs, right? I think that's a remarkable evolution, right, that my book you know, tries to, to, to flesh out. So in the public memory of Du Bois, and I think we have to appreciate him uh, in all of his uh, brilliance and all of his commitments, right, especially his opposition to war. Wonderful. 
Um, so some of the questions that were sent in advance we've touched on our, already. There was a question about how Du Bois' statements and opinions about African Americans and the military changed specifically across his three autobiographies. Mm. Um, and there's another question about um, what were the experiences of black American women in World War I yeah. um, and uh, what roles did they play? Yeah. Uh, du Bois' views on war evolve. Um, as I said, I mean, he's supporting a World War I. Uh, by the 1950s, he is you know, firmly opposed to war under any circumstances. Uh, he grudgingly accepts that African Americans are going to have to do their part uh, in World War II, but th by that time, he is deeply cynical um, and believes that black people didn't have democracy before the Second World War, and they're certainly not going to, to have it um, afterwards. Uh, so uh, he becomes uh, much, uh, more, um, much more firm in his anti-war convictions, uh, definitely connected to his growing uh, disillusionment about uh, World War I and its ultimate failure. Um, in terms of the experiences of African-American women, uh, this is, quite frankly, one of Du Bois' flaws, right? that he really does not acknowledge the important role that African American women played in the war effort. The title of his book, The Black Man and the Wounded World, is reflective of how he viewed the war kind of principally as a struggle around black manhood and black soldiers right, as heroic manly figures uh, leading the race into uh, the future. Uh, so Du Bois' writings about the war were infused with his, um, uh, uh, with his patriarchy, uh, with his uh, belief in linking manhood to, to racial progress. Um, and not acknowledging the important role that black women played, both as historical actors in the war, but also as writers um, of, of history. Wonderful. Um, and I think on that note, we're going to open it up to our audience, both in person and virtual. So are there any questions from our in-person audience first? We have microphones on both aisles down uh, here. Yep. <laughs> We have Professor Martin Summers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, wonderful opening comments and uh, conversation. Um, I'm, I'm, I haven't read the book yet, but I'm uh, very much uh, eager to. And um, when you put the um, table of contents up, that was, I, I found that really intriguing because mm -hmm. sandwiched between the chapters, Black England and Black America was other black folk. <laughs> so <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that chapter was and, and does it reflect Du Bois's uh, thoughts about diaspora? Absolutely. Yeah, so Du Bois was envisioning a, a deeply diasporic book. Um, and that was really informed by the time that he spent in France organizing the Pan-African Congress uh, in, in February of 1919, of meeting Blaise Young, the uh, uh, Senegalese deputy to the French parliament, uh, learning about the experiences of uh, African troops serving in the French um, army in particular. So he was really thinking about a global story and um, a diasporic story. So the chapter is that he uh, tentatively drafted, uh, thinking about uh, the future of Pan-Africanism in the wake of the war, uh, a chapter devoted to uh, African soldiers who served in the French army, uh, West Indian troops who served in the British uh, army. Uh, he hadn't actually started drafting the, the other black folk <laughs> chapter. Um, but I think we can kind of speculate you know, what that was going to look like in terms of incorporating the experiences of other black troops, uh, black servicemen, both as combatants as well as laborers um, in all different aspects um, of the war. Uh, so he very much envisioned uh, the war, you know, as being kind of inextricably connected to uh, the the future of the African uh, diaspora. We have Ryan Woods from American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society. <laughs> Thank you. My. Great grandfather uh, served in Company M, 365th uh, Infantry, 92nd Division, Second one Division, of the yeah. Buffalo Soldiers. Yeah. My first ancestor born after emancipation, 
and his service started three generations of military service in that line of my family. My question is, to what extent did Du Bois see a difference between his opposition to war and military as a form of employment uh, in the role of government in helping to establish uh, some economic opportunity uh, for black Americans? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, an interesting question. You know, Du Bois, he really unabalorized uh, the black military experience and respected uh, military service um, as a career, uh, as a kind of symbolic representation of African American citizenship, claims to citizenship, um, valorizing black officers in particular as kind of the, the, the fighting arm of his talented 10th, as I talk about in the book, but even in terms of his own uh, personal uh, genealogy, right? You know, how he writes about his, what was his great, great, great grandfather who served in the American Revolution? Great, great. Or, great, great. Okay. Tom Burkhart. Right, and then his father who, had a very kind of unglamorous stint in the, the Civil War. Alfred Du Bois. Alfred Du Bois, right? So <laughs> she, she knows her stuff, right? It's going to be a good book. Um, so he's trying to kind of create this kind of very heroic genealogical past um, for himself. Um, and I think that's infusing his respect and valoration of, um, of the black military uh, experience. Um, you know, it's interesting to think uh, about your question in terms of how Du Bois' views evolved and how his book, if it had actually been published, you know, would have reflected his, um, uh, his, his more kind of intent focus on economics um, of uh, the relationship between um, war, capital, labor, uh, thinking about black military service, you know, not necessarily as just you know, a form of uh, of combat, but as a form of, um, of, of labor uh, itself. Um, again, there's so many things that we missed out on <laughs> in Du Bois uh, not finishing his, his book, and I think that kind of economic analysis is, is one of them. I'm going to uh, uh, pass it off to, to Margaret, um, again, who has going to share virtual questions. We have some great questions coming in uh, from our virtual audience. Uh, a great one here is, who were Dr. Du Bois's supporters in the decisions he made? Um, what was his, you know, who was in his camp, who was on his team uh, for those big decisions? All right. Well, I guess it, it depends when we're talking about, right? I and mean, so if we're, we're talking about during the war itself, his biggest supporter uh, was definitely Joel Spinger, um, one of his uh, closest friends who, as Du Bois writes later on, deeply influenced his uh, views about the war, his patriotism, um, influenced his decision to write Close Ranks. There's a lot of intrigue <laughs> behind that that I get into the book. Uh, he was applying for a captaincy in the military intelligence division at the time at Joel Spinger's uh, behest. Um, so certainly during the war, I would say Joel Spinger is probably one of his uh, biggest allies. Um, James Weldon Johnson, who I talk about in the book, another really important ally for Du Bois, John Hope, uh, the president of Morehouse College, another very close friend of uh, Du Bois, uh, who served with the YMCA uh, in France uh, during the war. Um, and it's, you know, as I, as I talk about in the book, his relationship uh, with these men you know, grows uh, and evolves throughout the 1920s and into the 1930s, and he outlives all of them, uh, which uh, kind of speaks to, again, the incredible longevity of Du Bois's life, but also how he had to reckon with, with tragedy and loss um, throughout his life uh, as well. Uh, he and Spingarn were an unusual duo. Uh, and can you talk just a little bit more about Spingarn and how they got to be such good friends or good uh, idealistic sorts. Yeah, yeah, Joel Spinger, he was um, a professor of comparative literature at Columbia University. He left academia to go into um, civil rights activism full time. Uh, he was one of the founding uh, officials in the NAACP. Uh, he and Du Bois were, in some ways, kind of kindred spirits, even though they came from very different backgrounds. Uh, they both were. Um, brilliant uh, intellectuals, both uh, very uh, committed 
to the causes uh, that they, uh, that they uh, believed in. Uh, they definitely didn't see eye to eye all the time. Sometimes they were at each other's throats, but they always had uh, a deep respect uh, for, for one another. Um, and you know, that relationship was you know, really pivotal to, as I write about in the book, uh, Du Bois's relationship uh, to World War I, but also his kind of faith uh, in the possibility of interracial brotherhood uh, as well. Hi, I've got two questions. One is, do you foresee anything being done with that book? Like you'll be the editor, you know, <laughs> or that kind of thing of making it available uh, to the general population? Mm -hmm. Or no? <laughs> well, when I first encountered it, I was, of course, naive. Like, I'm going to finish Du Bois's book for him. Right? And then my dissertation advisor told me, you better write your dissertation. Right? Um, you know, I think it's an incredible manuscript. Uh, it's definitely incomplete. Uh, some of the chapters are quintessentially Du Bois. Others are works in progress, literally pieces of paper cut and pasted on top of other pieces of paper uh, compiled over, uh, over the decades. Some of the chapters are, are not written at all, like the other Black Folk uh, chapter. So I would love to, to think creatively in how to present that. Um, there's still some questions regarding publication rights and permissions and things of that sort, which need to be ironed out. Um, but if all the stars align, you know, hopefully, you know, I could or or someone can can present uh, Du Bois's uh, materials uh, in a way that the the public can can experience them. So you touched upon this a, a bit. I'm wondering about what what was it that gave that. Uh, and uh, sparked him to have so, so much hope that colleagues were critical. Was it what he saw in France? So mm. I think it's kind of a hoping against hope. Is so. I, yeah. It was it, and you mentioned what he, you know, the soldiers fighting in the, for, on the French side and so on. Mm -hmm. So what? Um, what gave Hard the boys say. hope? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where did that hope come from? And I structure the book in, in three parts. The first part of the book is, is titled Hope. All right? The second part of the book, Disillusion. The third part of the book, Failure. And I wanted to take Du Bois' hope seriously. Um, I wanted to take hope kind of as a, as a concept uh, that has been deeply infused uh, in African American history and struggles for, for freedom uh, seriously. Uh, du Bois believed that the war was going to be a transformative moment, right? Especially akin to the Civil War, right? I mean, he kind of valorized Frederick Douglass, who, who famously said, let the black man put the brass letters US on his chest. No one can deny that he is a citizen and deserves his freedom, right? I'm paraphrasing, but that's pretty much what, what Douglass said in that famous recruiting call. So Du Bois, um, has a, an understanding of war and black military service as an engine of potentially radical democratic trans transformation. So when the United States enters the war, when Woodrow Wilson is saying, we're going to make the world safe for democracy, Du Bois is, is, is latching onto that, but also expanding it, right? to incorporate his own ideas of democracy for black people and other peoples of African descent throughout the entire diaspora. So his hopes were not necessarily naive. Right? I think it's really important, as I try and talk about in the book, to take Du Bois's hopes uh, seriously, to see how committed he is to trying to make this war something potentially revolutionary. But the reality is it didn't turn out that way. Du Bois has to reckon with that. He has to come to that harsh acceptance that the war was indeed a failure. And that was very difficult for him uh, to do. I think that wraps up our question. That is just such an amazing note to end on. And mm. I'm, I'm so excited about your reading that I, I just, I, we, have to, we have to go to it. If you need your book, I'll get you your book. Um, <laughs> 
I thank you both of you for this incredibly enriching and eye-opening conversation. Um, you've painted a really remarkable picture of, um, of a time and you brought the black experience of World War II and the, the climate there um, into really sharp focus for all of us and the racism on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, really so much to learn. And as we do for all our American Inspiration authors, um, we have asked, um, We've asked Dr. Williams to read, please, from his book um, in closing as we move toward closing. Do you want to borrow Dr. Fields' book, or can I Sure, bring... yeah. Okay, excellent. I just know this to be a great reading. We can't skip it. Um, oh, let's see. There's, there's a lot of good stuff to read from in, in this book. Now. <laughs> um, but let me, um, let me end with, with Du Bois and his, his final words, uh, because I think they're, they're so powerful um, and, and really speak to how he viewed his life uh, and he viewed his, his legacy. Um, so I begin the book uh, with Du Bois actually writing his, his final words uh, in uh, 1957 in his uh, Brooklyn home. Uh, and uh, these are the words that were read uh, at his funeral uh, in Ghana. It is much more difficult in theory than actually to say the last goodbye to one's friends and loved ones and to all the familiar things of this life. I'm going to take a long, deep, and endless sleep. This is not a punishment, but a privilege to which I have looked forward for long years. I have loved my work. I have loved people and my play. But always I have been uplifted by the thought that what I have done well will live long and justify my life. That what I have done ill or never finished can now be handed on to others for endless days to be finished while I rest. And that peace will be my applause. One thing alone I charge you. Live and believe in life. Always human beings will live and progress to greater, broader, and fuller life. The only possible death is to lose belief in this truth, simply because this greater end comes slowly, just because time is long. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, Du Bois's legacy, your deeply researched and a really important perspective on the unfinished work of democracy, um, which is the book must be read by everyone. A reminder to our audience, um, copies of tonight's book will be available in the lobby um, for signature, thanks to uh, the Postman Books around the corner on Newbury Street in partnership with the Boston Public Library. And also for our online audiences, uh, copies of The Wounded World can be purchased from our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge. Use the code AMINTS23 um, as you order and your book will come signed um, by Dr. Williams. We have seen signed some book plates tonight. So those will go out to you in the uh, virtual audience. And now before we close, um, just some information about the organizations tonight and some of our upcoming events. First, uh, we at American Ancestors and EHGS are delighted to have co-presented tonight's talk with the BPL and with the Museum of African American History. Uh, if you are researching a time in history, a place, or a person, um, we could be helpful to you. Members can access our digital archives and databases of 1.4 billion searchable records any time of day or night. Free to the public, those of you doing family history research, you can chat with one of our genealogists, um, or you can uh, attend one of our Bruce Family Learning Center programs. Um, you'll see on the screen now that we um, are helping Americans of all sorts, new and old, to research their history. Um, our mission is to educate, inspire, and connect people. And for you literary sorts, uh, join us for some upcoming author talks, again, in the American Inspiration Author Series. On May 23rd, in a virtual talk, we'll be looking at Western history. Mark Lee Gardner will present The Earth is All That Lasts, 
Horse to Crazy Horse Sitting Bull and the Last Stand of the Great Sioux Nation. On June 5th, join us online for more insight into the American colonial era and its link to today. Um, author, economist, and professor Dror Goldberg um, will be talking about his University of Chicago publication, Easy Money, American Puritans, and the and Invention of Modern Currency, just recently reviewed in the Wall Street Journal. And on June 20, the day after Juneteenth, um, this same collection of partners, uh, we work together often, we will be presenting uh, the new book, King, A Life. Biographer Jonathan Eig will be joined by Peniel Joseph of the University of Texas, Austin, for this discussion. Um, we look forward to seeing you again. Um, and Christian, over to you for some happenings from the Museum of African American History. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, it's an honor to be here on behalf of the Museum of African American History in Boston and Nantucket. I'm gonna bring us to our next slide so we can get into the meat um, and talk about our upcoming showcase exhibit. Join us next month at the Museum of African American History in Boston and, and Nantucket for the launch of the Emancipation Proclamation, A Pragmatic Compromise, a showcase exhibit that explores the legacy of the celebrated American document that changed the course of the Civil War, freed enslaved people in the Confederacy, and allowed men of African descent to join the fight for freedom. Our exhibit introduces Boston's 1863 Emancipation Proclamation Jubilee events, one hosted by upper-class whites to raise money to educate those enslaved, and the other organized by black Bostonian William Cooper Nell and held at Tremont Temple, the nation's first church built to equally host an interracial congregation. Audiences come away with a new understanding of the reality that surrounded the enactment of this document, and exposure to how lesser known abolitionists, as well as Frederick Douglass, who led, uh, as well as Frederick Douglass, who led African, the African American fight for freedom and, Af uh, and equal rights. In commemoration of the Juneteenth holiday, we situate Juneteenth within a history of Freedom Day celebrations that preceded it. Centering the Jubilee events in Boston, we reveal how Freedom Day celebrations, including Juneteenth, mark the unfinished work of abolition. And I'll, at this time, I'll pass it over to Kristen, uh, who's from BPL, to close and offer some information about events at the Boston Public Library. Thank you, Kristen. Kristen, thank you, professors, um, Williams and Field. Thank you for sharing that slice of, of important history that might be new to some of us. So. Um, thank you all for being here today, and thank you, those of you in person and those of you online. Um, I'd just like to share some resources, services, and programs very quickly from the Boston Public Library. You can find out more at bpl.org. We have books, services, resources, and programs like this one, as well as programs for people of all ages. Um, all of those are listed on our events link on our website. And we do have a couple of other programs like this one coming up, including this Thursday. We have one of our Lowell lectures with Wawa Gatheru um, in our Abbey Room, and that will be available hybrid, so you can attend online or in person. She will be in conversation with BPL President David Leonard. So we hope that you'll check out what we have, and you'll join us again in the future, and there are a few of our other, other programs up there, and you can see that online. Thank you again, all of you who've joined us either online or here in person. It was a pleasure to welcome you and have you here, and thank you again to our featured speakers. Um, and now, with that, um, we will be doing a book signing right outside, so if you're here in person, we hope that you will join Professor Williams out at the table right in the lobby. And for those of you online, thank you for coming. Take care. Good night. Mm -hmm.